Hi, my name's Alistair, and in this video I'm going to show you how to create uh, this escape room puzzle, uh, which I call a valves puzzle. Um, now I've seen it dressed up in a couple of different uh, themes, but the basic idea is that you've got a number of different uh, levels of some meter or other uh, indicated by these LED strips. So this could be um, the pressure inside three different phases of an airlock, or it could be the water level inside three different pipes, um, or if you're doing an 80s themed room, it could be like levels on a graphic equalizer or something like that. Three different uh, independent levels, and each one of those is controlled by a, a valve of some sort. Now I'm using um, simple just uh, dials here, but you can obviously um, get more elaborate knobs or any kind of rotary input. And each rotary input is going to change the level on uh, one of the corresponding lights over there. Then on this side, uh, as always, I've put a maglock here, but the idea is that this can be uh, any kind of uh, load that is triggered by the relay here. And when the player sets the levels to the right level in each of the three different uh, meters, this is released. So I think uh, I set the level for uh, this to be um, five to nine for the three levels. Um, now that could be uh, indicated um, maybe by a, a line drawn on the prop itself, or maybe that could be a code given somewhere else in the room. So if I move this last meter up to nine, there we go, uh, the puzzle releases and the maglock falls onto my leg. Okay, so now I've shown it to you in action, um, let me talk through uh, each of the components a little bit more in uh, detail as to what's going on here. So um, right in the middle here, I've got an Arduino uh, Uno. Um, you can use uh, other flavors of Arduino, but the Uno is the most common. It's the simplest to program and use. It's pretty robust. Um, and whichever model you use, you need to make sure you have enough analog inputs um, to control the number of levels. So. Uh, if you're using an Uno like me, um, you can have up to six uh, valves um, or six displays, six valves, um, because each one of these inputs is going to go into um, an analog input. So uh, if you're not familiar with Arduino, it basically has a, a row of digital pins on this side. Digital pins are just on or off. Um, and then it also has a smaller number of analog pins that can actually uh, read a value between 0 and 1023. Um, so when you want something that has kind of like a fine level of control, which is what we're going to do in this puzzle, um, it's the number of analog pins that's important. So uh, here we have the input. Um, so again, I'm using um, what are called linear potentiometers um, or POTS sometimes. If you ever see them referred to as POTS, that's a potentiometer. And what I've got is there are three pins on a potentiometer. Um, the left handmost pin is going to ground on the Arduino. The right handmost pin is going to the 5 volt output. And then the middle pin is going to that analog input. And what happens is when you twist the dial all the way to the left, uh, what that signal is being read on that middle pin is ground because that's what we connect to the left pin. As you twist the dial more and more to the right, the value that you pick up in that middle pin gets closer and closer to the 5 volt supply that was on the other leg of the potentiometer. So it's like a, it's a bit like a variable resistor, it's not quite the same, but it, uh, what it's doing is having an adjustable voltage that can be measured depending on how far you turn uh, that dial in the middle. And like I said, uh, a potentiometer just has like a threaded uh, end on the end of it. I've just put simple little caps on the end here but you can get some quite nice um, 3D printed um, ornate valves and things like that to make this a little bit more in the theme with your puzzle. Um, I've kept it simple because I just want to focus on the electronics for now. So we've got three uh, pots in a row. Those are all read by uh, analog input pins here. Now uh, the code, which I'll show you a bit later, reads those values and converts it into a number from naught to nine and that number is used to light up the number of corresponding LEDs here. So uh, on this side of the Arduino, I've got three resistors connected to digital pins, and these are going through this blue, yellow, and green wires here um, to the data input pin, which is the middle pin of these LED strips. Um, 
These are then connected to uh, also five volt and ground, um, like the linear pots. Now, these ones I'm actually powering from the onboard five volt supply on the Arduino. The LED strips, I've got a separate five volt input coming on this side. Um, that's quite important. LEDs can draw a reasonable amount of uh, current and um, you don't really want to power things like that directly from your Arduino board. So even though it's running on a five volt supply, which is the same supply as the Arduino, it's best to keep that power source uh, isolated. And I've also got uh, just in the corner here, a capacitor across the um, power lines as well. That's gonna smooth out any spikes when you first power on um, that power output, which could damage the LEDs. So I've just got a capacitor there. Um, and then the code reads the values of here, lights up the lights. And if the levels of all three of these um, meters are equal to whatever the correct code was set in the code, uh, this relay over here is um, activated. So normally it's high, which is why the red light is on at the moment. Um, and that is keeping the maglock locked. Uh, you'll notice I've actually removed the bar from the maglock because I don't want it to fall uh, on me again. <laughs> um, uh, but when this is set to the uh, right level, uh, so what was it, five, two, nine, wasn't it? Uh, you see the red light goes off here. Uh, the maglock would at this point normally be crushing my thigh again. Um, just in the bottom corner here, um, uh, just to say, so the maglock also has a separate power. This is a 12 volt maglock. Um, I didn't actually have any 12 volt power supplies lying around. So I'm using an old laptop power supply but that was rated at 19 volts. Um, so this thing here is a very, very useful little thing. This is just an adjustable um, uh, voltage step down. Uh, it's called transformer. Um, you'll see it says 12.1 at the moment um, because it's actually rated a little bit high. But if I twist this dial in the middle here, uh, you should be able to see me adjust that. Oh, that's going the wrong way back to 12.0. So I've actually got my laptop input going in here uh, and this, this is stepping down the voltage to 12 volts to power the maglock. Um, I might do a separate video about these because these are great little modules. Um, and there we go, that's uh, the hardware. Okay, so this puzzle uses um, a couple of different electronic components that I haven't shown in any videos before. So I just wanted to go into a little bit more detail about uh, those particular components. So the first one is um, a linear potentiometer. Um, and I've got a handful of those here. Um, so they come in slightly different styles. Um, this one you can see is slightly stubbier than that one. Um, this one's got like a threaded uh, handle. This one's got a slightly longer uh, thing there. Uh, but they all have uh, three pins, as I described, like that. Uh, and the idea is that you uh, apply uh, a voltage difference between uh, the two outside pins. So you normally put ground on this pin and you put five volts on this pin. And then as you move the uh, wiper inside all the way from that side to that side, uh, you take a voltage reading on the middle pin um, and that will tell you how much the dial has been turned. So the dial sort of locks at about that far round, that's all the way to the left. And then it does most of a 360 circle um, to get around to the other side. Uh, now potentiometers come in different uh, ratings and they normally have printed on them. Um, so if I show you for example uh, this one, um, hopefully if my camera can show you something that up close. Um, bear with. There we go. Sorry about the way. So you see there, it says, it says uh, B10K at the top of it. So that is a 10,000 uh, ohm one. I've got one here that is a 100 ohm. And uh, what's this one? This one is a uh, 22,000 ohm there. So I've got three different uh, ratings there. Um, it actually doesn't matter for the purposes of the prop what rating um, you use. I'm actually using uh, 10,000 ohm um, ones there, but you could use 5,000 ohm or 1,000 ohm instead if you want. Um, because when you do the analog read, reading on the uh, Arduino, what you're really doing is measuring the proportion that the dial has been turned around. So it doesn't matter whether you're 50% through a dial that goes up to 10,000 or whether you're 50% through a dial that goes up to 100,000, you're still 50% of the way around. Um, 
So it doesn't actually uh, matter, but I get the three the same. Like I say, I'm using 10,000 ohm uh, resistors. So if you want to use the same as me, that's what I'm using. Uh, 10,000 ohm potentiometers. And of course, the other new component which I used in this puzzle were the LED light strips. Um, now, I think these are fantastic components. I think they're really, really uh, great to use. Um, if you imagine trying to create this puzzle using individual LEDs, uh, you'd have to wire each one of these LEDs here into its own uh, data pin uh, and to ground separately it would take ages, lots of soldering, very frustrating and you'd run out of pins on the Arduino very quickly. Um, but these uh, strips here are um, what they call individually addressable LEDs. So it's basically a little microprocessor inside the strip itself which means that with a single data line you can actually control um, not just which LEDs come on and off, but also set them to a, a different colour, um, sort of hue and, and saturation and things like that. I think they're brilliant. So um, they come supplied uh, normally on a reel that looks a bit like this. Uh, so I've actually got um, several one metre strips on this reel here. Um, and they are uh, they're very, very clever because you can basically cut them to length. Um, so this particular this particular one here, I've got um, a 30 LED per meter spacing. So um, LED strips come in different uh, densities. You can either get 30 a meter, uh, 60 per meter, or I think 144 per meter. So this is the least dense version, which is the easiest to work with um, because you've got a reasonable. There's about an inch spacing there between each LED. And on the uh, strip itself, if you see between uh, the LEDs. Um, once again, the autofocus on my camera, I'm afraid, is, is not great at this point in time. Um, if you see between the LEDs there, these gold uh, pins across here, those contacts, you can cut right along that um, black line there and uh, divide this in two at that point and just wire those pins into uh, ground five volt supply and a data pin on your Arduino as they uh, are indicated there. Um, so if you wanted to, you could take your one meter strip of 30 LEDs and cut them into 30 individual LEDs. Um, there wouldn't be a whole lot of point in doing that. Um, but what I've done is taken a one meter strip and cut it into um, three sections, each with nine LEDs. Um, so all of these were made from a single one meter strip. Um, they do come in slightly different uh, varieties as well. Um, so some have two data pins. I'm using ones that only have one data pin. I found them to be cheap and I found them too easier to work with. Um, and these are 5 volt supply power. Some use 12 volt supply power. Um, so the general name for uh, the ones I'm working with are called NeoPixels. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's actually a brand name or not. I bought them cheap off eBay. I'll include a link uh, in the documentation so you can get exactly the same as me. Um, but these are brilliant things and I'll show you how to use them in code. Okay, so here's another look at the uh, wiring just in case you couldn't really make it out on the board there. Um, so it's a slightly more um, complicated setup than I've shown in some of my um, other puzzles. There's a few more components involved, um, but a lot of it is quite similar to uh, things I've used before. So uh, we've got the maglock uh, with a 12 volt supply wired into a 5 volt relay, and that's using the um, normally open pin here. Um, so the relay has to be powered with high to activate the maglock, and that's its normal state while the puzzle is in action. And then the uh, signal pin for the relay is going into, um, it's actually going to A5 on the UNO just because that's the way that it lined up best with the way I had the board set up. Um, it doesn't need to be an analog uh, pin. It can be any any pin capable of digital output can be there. Um, so uh, that was just for convenience sake. Then we've got down here, I've got the, um, the linear pots. Um, and as explained, they go between uh, ground and five volt on the outer legs. And then each one has a separate signal lead going to the middle leg and they go to the analog uh, in pins A0, A1 and A2. Um, if you wanted to extend this puzzle with uh, more valves, that's fine. Um, just add more onto, uh, onto the end here and give them their own uh, analog signal pin there. Uh, and then sort of on the display side here, I've got my um, NeoPixel strips. 
um, let's say the ground and the 5 volt are coming from a separate 5 volt supply over here um, and that just needs to be rated um, high enough for the current draw of your LEDs. So if you're using um, RGB LEDs like I am, so each LED in that strip actually contains uh, three uh, LEDs. It has a red, a green and a blue. Um, and that's what allows you to blend them together to get um, different colours. So each of those red, green and blue LEDs draws around 20 milliamps, let's say. So if uh, they're all on maximum brightness, so if your LEDs are displaying maximum brightness, that would be 60 milliamps in total. Um, and then if all of your LEDs are on and you have a strip of nine, that's obviously nine times uh, 60 milliamps times the number of strips you have as well. So I've got three strips. Um, and that will give you a, a total idea of um, what the rating of this power supply should be. So it should always be five volts, um, but in terms of the number of amps um, that this uh, um, is capable of supplying um, to make sure your LEDs get enough power. It's, it's always okay to have uh, too many amps in your power supply. Um, generally, in fact, that's, that's a good thing because it means that your power supply is having to work less hard. It's not nearly at capacity. Um, the LEDs will only draw as much current as they actually need. Um, but you need to make sure that that is uh, rated highly enough. So I think I'm using a, a, a three amp power supply um, in my example here. If you add more LED strips or if you have a, a higher density of LEDs or more LEDs, um, you just need to make sure that that is high enough rated. And I've got a, a capacitor here across the power lines. Um, when you first turn the power on, it's quite common to have a bit of a, a spike in the power supply. And uh, these LEDs can be quite sensitive to uh, power spikes. So um, there's a capacitor here which is just going to um, sort of smooth out that power supply. Um, I'm using a 470 microfarad uh, capacitor, um, which is kind of a fairly standard size, and that's just going to smooth out the power supply. Um, I've also got uh, just here over the data lines, I've got 330 ohm um, resistors. Um, just in series with each of the data input pins um, and that's just uh, best practice to, to protect the pins on your Arduino. And here is the code that's running on the Arduino. Um, so uh, if you followed any of my previous um, videos you'll probably know that I have a kind of a fairly consistent style which I follow. Um, so I always start off at the top by including any uh, libraries that are used so I'm using um, something called the Fast LED Library, um, and you can get it for free from this GitHub link here. Uh, this is going to provide a load of functions that's going to make using the LED strips uh, a bit easier. Um, so it's going to provide some, some useful functions we're going to make use of from that. So you can download it and install it uh, from here. Uh, then if I've got any um, defines which I'm using in my code, so if I want to sort of change the uh, way in which the code runs, um, I always have a, a debug define here and when that is set on, so if that uh, wasn't commented out, um, that would give me additional debug information normally over the serial connection. Um, so that's uh, what that's doing there. Um, I have another define um, and I'm going to define the number of LEDs in each strip. Uh, now I'm using uh, 9, uh, you might think it would be 10, but obviously um, if the player has to represent the digit 0, I'm actually going to say, well, that, that's turn all the LEDs off, so that's none lit at all. Um, so I actually need to have 9 in each strip, not um, 10. Uh, and then we go through the constants, so these are the things which we define that are not going to change uh, throughout the duration of the puzzle. So we define the three pins that the uh, inputs are going to be connected to, so this is where the, the linear pots are connected to, um, and there are three of them. And then this here, this is going to be the a value that needs to be read on each of those three inputs to solve the puzzle. Um, so remember I had mine set to 5 on the first input, then 2, and then 9 on the last one. Um, but obviously you change that there to whatever you want uh, the puzzle to be. Uh, and then we also define the pin that the uh, relay is attached to, which is going to release the lock uh, when that solution has been entered. Um, now, uh, normally in some of my other puzzles, you'd uh, expect me to 
also define here the pins that the um, LED strips are plugged into. I'm not actually going to do that here, that's going to come in the setup function later. Um, and the reason for that is that the fast LED library um, doesn't like the pin numbers to be variables, they've actually got to be hard coded, so they're, they're going to come a bit later on. So don't be surprised that you can't see them here. And then we set up a couple of uh, global variables, so things which uh, are going to change um, over the duration of the puzzle. Um, so we will set up an array here, and this array is going to hold whatever the, uh, the current reading on each of the uh, inputs is. Um, this is where we're going to declare our array of LEDs. Um, so this CRGB bit here, this comes from the fast LED library. And what it says is we're going to make actually a, a 2D array um, of LEDs. We're going to have uh, effectively a number of columns equal to the number of pots. And then we're going to have a number of rows, uh, which is going to be the number of LEDs in each strip. Um, so we're going to be able to address each LED. So if we say like LED um, 2, 3, that's going to be the third LED up. Uh, the second strip along. Okay. Um, now, uh, you may have noticed, I didn't really describe it much in the puzzle, but you may have noticed that um, uh, I made the LEDs flicker a little bit in the video earlier, just to make it slightly more interesting. Um, so what we did is actually added some random noise to the value, um, and that can make it uh, more look like your LEDs resemble um, uh, either a fluid in a pipe or maybe a, a flame or something like that. So we're, we're going to add a bit of random noise and this is just a, uh, and in fact the next line down as well. These are just some uh, noise values which are going to add on to just vary the brightness and the hue of each LED to make it a little bit more interesting. And then uh, again this is always how I set up my puzzles. I, I have a number of different states uh, just so we can check what the what the state of the puzzle is at the moment. Is it starting up? Uh, is it in play so the players can actually uh, use it at the moment or has it been solved and obviously we the initial state is always going to be initializing so that's how we start it up okay so that's all the variables at the top and then we'll move on to the functions uh, so here we have a, a simple function uh, this says uh, this is the function that's called to check if the puzzle is solved um, so it's quite simple uh, what it does is it loops over each of the um, pot values and it looks what their current reading is. If um, the current reading of any of the pots is not equal to the solution to that pot, obviously at least one of them is wrong, therefore the puzzle can't have been solved yet. If we loop over all the pots and find out that actually the current readings is equal to the correct solution, then the puzzle has been solved, so we return true. Um, and then well, what do we do if the puzzle is true? Uh, if the puzzle is solved rather, we call this method, so this is the onSolve method. Um, if we are debugging, so if that uh, conditional define at the top was defined, uh, we'll just send out a little bit of information over the USB link to say, yep, the puzzle's been solved. And what we do is we release that maglock by um, sending the signal to the relay pin low. Um, so it starts off being high, we send it low, that's what releases the maglock, uh, which inevitably uh, falls on top of my toe or something like that. And we change the puzzle state to solved. Uh, there's a matching uh, function here, so this is what happens when the puzzle becomes uh, unsolved. Now it's up to you um, how you want to define how your puzzle works. Sometimes you'll have a puzzle which the players solve and once it's solved it remains solved forevermore. Um, so that's what we normally describe as a latched puzzle or a latched solution. Um, sometimes you let the players solve the puzzle and then if they change the uh, values again so that they no longer show the right solution um, it becomes unsolved um, and so that's what this function would do in that case um, and all it does simply is um, locks the maglock again, so it kind of sets the puzzle back to uh, the running state. Okay, so there's some help functions. So here we have the um, the setup function. Um, if we're debugging, I need to initialize um, serial connection with the PC. Um, I don't use the serial connection for anything else in this puzzle, so I only need to uh, activate that if we are debugging. Uh, we loop over and initialize all of the pins that the pots are connected to. 
and then we initialize each of the pins that the LED strips are connected to. Um, so remember I mentioned earlier that the fast LED function doesn't like um, variable assignments for its pins. They have to be hard coded. So rather than looping over all the pins, which is what I did for here, um, for the pots, um, we're actually going to explicitly just add one line for each set of LEDs in a strip. So I've got one set connected to pin 3 um, and that's going to be the first uh, group in my array. I've got one set connected to pin 4, one set connected to pin 5 and all of the strips have got the same number of LEDs in them which is num LEDs in each strip and if you remember I defined that back at the top here as 9. So if you're creating longer strips uh, or if you have perhaps the, the version of the LED strips with more LED density, um, you can change that uh, value there to be whatever you want instead. So we're still in setup. Um, we initialize the lock pin, that's going to be an output pin, and it starts off being high, so that means that the relay is activated and the lock is closed at the start of the puzzle. Um, we just initialize those noise values, so we're going to choose three random values, which is going to give us a a uh, nice kind of bit of variation in the LEDs, give them a bit of flicker and sparkle, and um, we're going to set the puzzle to running. Okay, here's another helper function. This one's called uh, fill noise, and actually this is um, based on one of the examples that comes with uh, the fast LED library. Um, so you don't need to worry about this uh, too much if you if you're sort of not really interested this is kind of a it's kind of the aesthetics of the puzzle rather than the the mechanics this one but what it does is it fills uh, a 2d array again so remember we've already got one array which is holding the values of each um, LED this one is going to fill another array with just some noise values um, based on a supplied speed and a scale um, so those various uh, those values are going to vary over time um, and the higher that the speed value is the more they're going to vary um, and or the faster they're going to vary sorry and the scale is going to be the more they're going to vary and we're just going to add that noise on to um, whatever the brightness of the LED is or whatever the hue of the LED is just to make them a bit more interesting but like I said this is kind of a this is a decoration function um, so don't don't worry too much about that um, now you might recall I said earlier on that the analog read function of an Arduino will give you a value from 0 to 1023. So when we read the value from our uh, linear pots to see how far those dials have been turned round, if the dial has been turned halfway let's say, we'd expect to get a reading of 512 because that's halfway between 0 and 1023. Uh, so what this function does is this is going to help us turn that value into a number between 0 and 9 instead uh, because that's going to tell us how many of the LEDs um, on our strip we want to light. Or if you've got uh, 20 LEDs in your strip or 30 LEDs or however many you've got, this is going to turn the value um, returned from analog read, which is 0 to 1023, it's going to scale that into the appropriate uh, range for the number of LEDs you've got instead. So this is just a, a mathematical function. Uh, so I was going to do that. Okay, the next one down. So this is our function that's going to read the input uh, from all of the pins. So we're going to call this uh, constantly in a loop while the program is running. So we're going to loop over all of the pots and get the raw value. And then we are going to scale that value using the function which we defined above, just here. So we're going to scale that down to the appropriate range. Uh, we're also going to constrain that range just to make sure that we don't get some slightly dodgy values. So sometimes um, on an analog reading you might accidentally get a slightly negative value if it's very close to zero, or you might get slightly over the top. Um, and we don't want to try and light a negative number of LEDs, um, so we'll just use this constraint function that makes sure that we don't get any uh, ropey values just to the very extremes. And we'll store whatever this scaled value is that we've calculated in the current readings array. 
Um, if we're debugging, we'll also chuck out some information to the serial monitor just so we can check what's going on. Uh, and this function here, so we're now onto the function that controls uh, how the LEDs are going to display the values. So um, this uh, function actually takes a parameter which I've called style um, and that's because, and I, I didn't point this out earlier, you may have noticed, when the puzzle is in play, so when it's running, um, I'm using one style to colour the LEDs which was kind of like a, a blue hue with uh, like a white dot at the top of it. When the puzzle becomes solved however though, as well as the maglock getting released, um, I changed the colour of the LED displays to a slightly more random a range of colours instead. Um, so that's controlled by um, passing this style parameter to the set display and you can you can define as many different um, styles as you want. Um, so the first thing we're going to do every time we call this function we're going to fill that noise array up with some noisy values um, just if we want to, to make it a bit more interesting. We're going to clear out uh, whatever value the LEDs might have been displaying before and then we're going to loop over all our inputs. So we're going to say for every um, input we have we're going to loop up from zero up to the current reading level. So this is like counting up um, the LEDs starting from the base of each meter. We're going to start at the bottom and we're going to count our way up until we get to the value that this, uh, th this meter should have. And we're going to colour the LEDs differently depending on what style um, was selected in the code. So if um, the parameter at the top, so if this parameter here was zero, which is what the default is, um, we're just going to colour those LEDs with a random noisy value um, from our noise function. 255 is the saturation, so it's going to be a bright noisy function, uh, or sorry, a very well coloured noisy function, and uh, this is going to be the brightness. So that's style naught is we're going to colour all of the LEDs kind of just the random colour basically. Um, style 2, um, so I think this is what I'm using at the moment when the puzzle is in progress. Um, so this time um, we're going to colour, so this uh, CHSV function, again this comes with the fast LED library. So HSV um, is a way of defining colours um, rather than saying RGB values you can give um, HSV values instead. So this is the hue. Um, 150, a value of 150 kind of uh, is a bluish uh, colour and then I'm going to add on a slight noise value onto that so it's going to be a, a round bluey purple hue each of the things. They're going to be a constant saturation, they're going to be fully saturated and then I'm also going to change the, um, the brightness slightly. Um, so this looks sort of complicated, it's not actually that bad. I'm taking a base level of 16 um, and then adding on two that's been bit shifted left uh, by X. Um, now X is uh, how many LEDs up the thing, uh, uh, how many LEDs up the meter we have currently counted up to. So basically, the higher up you get um, up the scale, this is going to make the um, the brightness increase as you get higher up the the level. That's all that's saying. So that kind of looks complicated. Again, don't worry. Uh, too much about this because this is purely aesthetics. Um, or the default here, um, and this is a much simpler one, um, so this is just saying every LED as we count to we're just going to colour them blue. Okay, so it's a nice simple one. Um, uh, so I might recommend if, you, if you're not too comfortable with the programming um, that's probably the simplest ex example to tell you what's going on here. Uh, so that is all of the LEDs starting from the base up to the reading and then the final value here um, uh, this is actually going to be the reading that each uh, meter is on at the moment and we're going to colour those white. So the very tip of each line, just to give a real indication to the player of exactly what a value they're reading as, we're just going to colour those bright um, white. And then we're going to show the LEDs. And then uh, we've got the uh, loop function at the bottom. So this is actually the main program loop. Um, we've kind of seen all the helper functions above. Um, and now we're just going to work out how they're called. So very simple, um, if we get to the loop function and we're initialising we're going to move on to the next stage which is running. Um, that shouldn't happen anyway because our setup function changed the puzzle state to running but, but just in case that's kind of a catch. 
While the puzzle is running, what we're going to do, so every frame we're just going to loop round and round and round there while the puzzle is running, we're going to get the player input. Then we're going to set display and we're going to set the style for one for this display. Um, so that's going to light the LEDs up using uh, whatever style was defined as one. So this is our kind of nice bluish hues here. Um, and then we are going to constantly check if the puzzle is solved. Remember that was the function that checked whether the input values were 5, 2, 9 in order. And if it is, we're going to call the unsolve method, which is the one that deactivated the maglock. Um, and then if the uh, puzzle is solved, all we're going to do each frame is just set the display constantly but this time we're going to use style zero so you'll be able to see if the puzzle is solved or not um, because the LEDs are going to be colored a different way than they were when the puzzle was running um, and when it's solved uh, I'm actually I've commented out the next line so we're not going to check for the input anymore so effectively the puzzle is going to become frozen um, uh, when it's been solved uh, once um, uh, like that uh, so that is uh, a lot more code than in any of my previous puzzles. There's a lot more to it. Um, although I hope you don't get too worried about it. A lot of the, the stuff that seemed more complicated was actually purely to do with um, aesthetic display, like I say, of the LEDs. The actual mechanics of the puzzle itself um, is, is relatively straightforward. So I hope that's um, given you some information about how you can create a puzzle like this. Um, like I say, it's quite easy to customise. You can add um, more LED strips. You can obviously include more LEDs in each strip as well, so you can make these much taller. Um, I've always tried to keep these things quite simple and unstyled um, so that you can actually see the electronics. But um, there's some good examples if you look up on the internet of sort of you know quite ornate uh, copper pipes and things with these sort of inlaid to make it look a lot more uh, interesting, I guess, to the player. Um, and uh, if you want to access the uh, additional documentation and the wiring diagram and the code listing, um, please uh, check the uh, additional links in the description. Um, and if you have any other comments, uh, please let me know. Um, thanks very much for watching. Oh, Christ.